Lord be with you. It's Jim Moore. It's good to be with you again on this radio show. You shall know the truth. That's what we've been talking about for the last several weeks. So I want to look at a couple of more lies. I hope we can get through them that they're related to each other and they have to do with the issue of law and grace. The first law that we're going to, or the first lie that we're going to look at, it, and it's very, very popular, and I mean very, very popular. A lie that we would see in the Bible Belt, all over the religious world. It's been around a long, long time, even back to the Galatians, as people try to mix Moses and Jesus. Here's the lie. Your goal should be to keep the Ten Commandments. And I hear some as they even say that, and they say, oh my gosh, what, what can he mean? Is he, is he saying we should go out and, and steal and kill and be mean? No, I'm not saying that at all. And when you really try to preach grace, we want to mix law in there but to try to keep the bounds set. What I'm saying is there is another source for morality and ethics, and it's not Moses. The source is Jesus Christ himself. It's not written on tablets of stone. It's the presence of Christ, his Holy Spirit, in us. So I want to go to Romans chapter 7 here as we look at this. Romans chapter 7 and verse 4. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Bring forth fruit unto God. There's the goal. That you be married to another. You were married to the, to the old man or to, the, to that law, but now the law is still there, but now you're dead. You're dead to it because of the body of Christ that you should be married to another wife that you could bring forth fruit unto God. It's the same thing that Jesus said in John chapter 15, verse 8, the Father's glorified that you bear much fruit. And what that really, all that means is, is that you are a living expression of Jesus to other people. That's 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 what happens. The, the love that he is that flows through you to other people. That's bringing forth fruit. But notice what begins the process here. You don't bear fruit unto God until you die to the law first. I want you to get a hold of that. You got to die to the law first. And what, what is that fruit? I just mentioned a minute ago. That fruit is love. So if you, if you want to bear the fruit of love, you don't fish through the, the law, the old covenant law, and try your hardest to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. It just won't happen. It just won't happen. We, we don't do it that way. We, we say Jesus lives in us. He is love. And if we... If we are trying to move away from coveting and learn the secret of contentment, we don't go to the Ten Commandments. Uh, the Ten Commandments that says, Thou shalt not covet. We, and we don't go there and say, Okay, I'm going to try really, really hard not to covet. I'm going to try really, really hard to love God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. Do your best. What we do is we look to Christ Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, Jesus Christ who is in us, and, and we say there is a secret of contentment. Paul said there was a secret of contentment, and Christ is that contentment. It's, it's not a thing. It's a person named Jesus. And we, we go to the Lord and, and we say, what, Lord, show me what it means to be fulfilled in you, what it means to be complete in you, what it means, the, this peace that passes understanding. What, does, what, what is that? 
and it's it's very personal it's it's being connected it's it's relationship we die to the law we die to that old husband now as I said a minute ago he's still alive I'm dead it's not you know Paul says you knew the how it was in the in the law or how it was you know in the old way as long as you're married to your husband you know, you're bound till death to us part. But but if he dies, you're free to marry another. But in this case, he's still alive. You died. You're crucified with Christ. Not I, but Christ. Our radio show. Not I, but Christ. So you died. You're, you're buried with him in his death. And you're raised to be married to another to bring fruit unto God. You got a new husband. His name is Jesus. And the, this Jesus I'm talking about is not the, the Jesus that... Walking around Galilee with sand on his sandals. This is the resurrected, ascended Christ, seated at the right hand of, of the Father, far above all principalities and powers. That's who you're married to. That's who you're seated with. That's who you're joined to in one body. He's the head, we're the body. That We're seated with him in heavenly places. That ascended Jesus. That's who we're married to. That's why it's okay to be under grace, and we don't need any of the law. None. Zero. If Christianity is nothing more than looking back to a historical teacher and finding the top ten things that Jesus did, and, and we try to emulate him, we try to do what he did, now we walk around with our WWJD, what would Jesus do, stickers and bracelets on. And we're, if, that's, if that's what Christianity is, then it's no better than Buddhism. It's no better than Islam. Looking back and trying to emulate what they did is not Christianity. What would Jesus do is not Christianity. Christianity is, is being spiritually joined, actually fused as one to the resurrected Jesus. My, we are his body, all connected. He rose from the dead. He has power over sin, power over death. We've been made one together with him. Grace works because Jesus is alive. Grace works because the ascended... Uh, the risen, ascended Christ Jesus dwells in us. If, if we look to the tablets of stone, we're acting like Jesus isn't rose from the dead. We're acting like the Israelites wandering around in a spiritual desert looking at tablets of stone to see what we should do. And then, you know, if we just do these ten things, then we'll be a good Christian. Paul the apostle has another definition of being a, a good Christian. To, to Paul, it's, it's one who is in total dependence uh, upon the Lord Jesus Christ and fixes his eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and, and that's the only way that we can move forward. Now, and, and I'm still in Romans here, verse 7. What should we say then? It's the law sin, God forbid. Now I'd say, I had not known sin but by the law. For I had not known lust except the law said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion, taking opportunity by the commandment, worked in me all manner of uh, con concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. Probably years worth of teaching right there on those two verses, but a couple thoughts here. Notice out of the 613 laws in the Old Testament, which one Paul is focused on? Thou shalt not covet. That comes from the Ten Commandments, from the tablets of stone. So it's not the ceremonial laws. This is moral law about how to behave. Thou shalt not covet. Paul says if you live under this rule here, of those ten that were written on the stone, you'll covet up a storm. It'll actually cause you to be worse. If you wake up every day and say, Thou uh, shalt not, you, you better not. If I can, I, it, 
If I can't stop it, God will be mad at me. If I, if I, if I covet, God is going to leave me. He's going to ditch me. Uh, you, it'll cause worse problems. I mean, have you ever tried living a day not, thou shalt not, doing something? People make New Year's resolutions all the time, and how long do they last? Three days? A week if you're really disciplined? That's exactly what the law is designed to do. So Paul, Paul had an issue of coveting here. He was under the law. He was a, a devout Pharisee, a Hebrew of Hebrews. He tried his best. He was determined. But it says sin took opportunity through the Ten Commandments. So if I teach you to be under the Ten Commandments, I'm giving sin an opportunity to come in and wreck your life. By inviting you to the Ten Commandments, I'm inviting you to a life of struggle. By inviting you to the Ten Commandments, I'm inviting you to move away from victory in Christ and to move toward absolute failure in Moses. It produced in Paul coveting of all sorts. Now notice this. Notice this. Um, uh, apart from the law, get me away from Moses. Apart from the law, look, sin is dead. But, I mean, do you see that? Sin is dead. Apart from the law, sin is dead. Notice Paul is not saying you need a part of the law. Well, there's 613. You know, we've been going over this for a while here. Let me just try to keep a few, you know, maybe just 10 out of the 613. Maybe just 10. We'll do that. That's not what Paul is saying. He's saying you need to live apart from the law completely. Clean, cut, dead to the law. And guys, that scares people to death. How am I going to stop my stealing? How am I going to stop my sinning if I, if I don't have a tablet or stone to look at? Paul says in Ephesians, stop stealing and get a job. Work with your hands. Offer your body to God. Don't, don't lie to one another. Why? Because you belong to one another. He's talking to the Ephesians, the church there. He says, stop stealing. Get a job. Work with your hands. Quit lying to one another because you, you belong to one another. Paul's reason is because we belong to each other, and that's a loving reason. That's a relationship reason. I belong to you. You belong to me. We're one body. Why would the hand want to lie to this hand? It's, it's ludicrous. If I lie to you, I'm not loving you. So there's a relational reason. And that's very, very different from the haunting threat of sin that deserves death. I wish people would get it. Uh, without the shedding of blood, there's no, there's no forgiveness. So if you sin, there's no going up front to a church and an altar and crying, Oh, God, please forgive me. No, if you want to be under the law, either you must accept that that Jesus has forgiven you once and for all, or there needs to be blood. And now we're back to uh, spitting in the face of Jesus saying his sacrifice didn't do it. So he's got to do it over and over and over again. But this priest, he offered one time, sat down, meaning it's done, it's over. You've been forgiven one time, and that's it. We don't need to harp on it anymore. Your sin and iniquity has been removed as far as the east is from the west. So this haunting threat of sin deserving death, hands being cut off, eyes being plucked out, people being killed because, why wow, the law required it. It's not an obedience to God out of fear. There's a new way to obey, a, a new reason to obey, a new source of obedience. And it requires a total divorce from Moses total divorce from us. I wish we could go into obedience for a long time, but oh, we got a new source for the whole thing. It's his obedience. He was obedient unto death, and he lives in me. It's, it's his obedience. My gosh, he, he, it, it, it's over. I mean, it's, it, it's done. If I go back and look to Moses, I'm cheating on Jesus because he's done it all. People, people, People talk around this, okay? And they say, oh, yeah, we're, we're dead to the ceremonial law. 
dead to the sacrificial system. We don't have to offer lambs anymore. But when someone is talking about the relationship to the law, they they have a big a big but here. And let me tell you, if if there's a, a but, you know, we don't keep the ceremonial law. We don't have to do the feast anymore. We don't have to offer lambs anymore. But if you hear that but, head for the door. Head for the door. There is no but when it comes to our connection to the law. We're dead to the law. Dead to it. We're not under the law. Christ is the end of the law for those who believe. We don't need tablets of stone up in our churches. Paul writes to the Corinthians. He shouldn't even have to write to the Corinthians. Why? Because they're they're Greeks. They're Gentiles. They were never under the law, but somehow or another, these Judaizers had come in, just like the Galatians had started talking to them about circumcision, talking to them about the law, wrecking uh, the church with a mixture of law and grace. And uh, let me let me flip over here. Second Corinthians, and and you see Second Corinthians three, verses seven. But if the ministration, the ministry of death, written and engraven on stones was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, how shall not the ministry of the Spirit be rather glorious? We got a competition of two ministries here a ministry of Moses, ministry of Jesus. The law came through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. We, we got a competition on our hands. In this corner weighing in, in this corner, this ministry is fading and will soon disappear. In this corner weighing in of eternal weight of eternal glory, eternal value, righteousness in Christ Jesus. See, that's what we have right now. We, uh, we, we got a better... Uh, Ministry, a more excellent ministry, a better covenant, superior to the Ten Commandments. Again, notice it's he's talking about that that was engraven on stones. We can we can talk around it all we want to, say it was ceremonial. He's talking about our beloved Ten Commandments that we put up on the sides of the building, that we want up in the courthouses, and we want them in the churches, and that we seem to worship. I heard a guy say on TV the other day, the church needs to stand up and start preaching the Ten Commandments. Absolutely not. That's the trouble that we're in now. The law had a beautiful purpose. Uh, well, it still has a beautiful purpose, but that purpose is for the unbeliever. And it's to convict them of sin. That's its job, not the believer. You've been made righteous. They see this law and they say, oh my gosh, I've fallen short of the glory of God. I need Jesus. That's for the unbeliever, not the believers. But then the unbeliever, once they come and they meet Jesus, Jesus never says, now go back to the Moses and take the, the yoke of the law. Jesus says, take my yoke upon you. you. You graduate from Moses when you start in Jesus. The law was our tutor, our schoolmaster to lead us to Christ. Now, in Christ, we're not under a tutor. The Holy Spirit has come. He'll guide us into all truth. In verse 9, For the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doeth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. Remember Moses coming down the mountain? He's been in the glory of God. His face is shining. But it's fading away. He's, he's a bit embarrassed. He covers his face. That, that glow is fading. Why is God letting this glow fade? He wants Israel to know that this is good for now, but something, someone better is coming. There was a ministry of condemna condemnation, and it had a glory. Much more does the ministry of righteousness exceed in that glory, so much so that the ministration of glory is no glory, no glory at all. Now I'm saying, wow, you, can you say that in a church, that the law has no glory, no business being in the church at all? You know, I talked to some preachers, and, you know, they have it up. They put it out front and put it on their walls, and they say, well, it's a good rule to live by. Remember the Ten Commandments here. He says this ministration of death, ministration of condemnation, has no glory. Why, 
Why? Because of the glory that exceeds it. Why would I go to something with an inferior glory when I have someone with a superior glory living in me? Why, why would I compromise? Why would I go to the lesser when I have him who is greater? Why would I go to something founded on inferior promises when I have someone who is the promise himself living in me, superior, far exceeding? New covenant is far greater than the old. Jesus is far greater than any of the best high priests, best priests of the old. And notice Paul called the Ten Commandments two things here. The, the, ministry, the ministry of condemnation and the ministry of death. What did Jesus say? Jesus said, I come that you might have life, not, not death. Now the law, again, has a purpose. Paul says the law is good. It's good if you use it properly. I'm not trashing it here, and, and I know this, that, that the law is not made for the righteous. You can read that. So the law is not made for you because you, born-again believer here in me, you've been made righteous. He that knew no sin was made to be sin, that you might be the, the righteousness of God. You've already been made righteous. So the law is not for you. Christ has made you, you righteous. The, the law is for the unrighteous. The law is for the ungodly to show them their need for Christ. So stop using it in the church as a tool for growth. That, that, that's a joke. If, if you want a surefire way to fail, we read back in Romans, uh, put yourself under a bunch of law and call them Christian principles. And uh, You know, you can go yourself, check in with God about your church attendance and your Bible reading and your witnessing. And we, we just made ourselves a bunch of modern day laws and Christian principles and I heard people say, well, our country's founded on Christian principles. Jesus is not a principle. The Holy Spirit is not a principle. He's the rock of my salvation. I don't need principles. I need the man himself. And the man himself lives in me. Christ, the Holy Spirit, Christ in you. We've made up all these rules. It varies a little bit between denominations, like, like witnessing. We totally messed that up and... and you know, there's only two or three verses that even talk about bringing the gospel to strangers and the whole new covenant, but we've made it the end-all, be-all of Christian experience. The fruit of the Spirit is not witnessing. Go read Galatians. The fruit of the Spirit is not church attendance. The, tuta, the fruit of the Spirit is not Bible reading. The fruit of the Spirit is not duty. It's not quiet time. God doesn't get his stopwatch out and say, okay, how much quiet time? And oh, we didn't spend enough quiet time. We've done that. The fruit of the Spirit is love. I mean, just look right here. Let me, let me just grab this real, real quick. Meekness, temperance, love, peace, joy, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. I mean, it's Galatians. We, we, we invent ways to measure ourselves. So, so it's not Moses, but it's a modern-day American Jesus that we think. And, you know, in the Bible Belt, we get our measuring stick out to see if we measure up to see how we're doing. You know, what would Jesus do and all that? So many times I hear people say, well, my walk with God's not very good. I say, why not? Well, I haven't done my quiet time. I missed two church services in a row. So we, we have this mentality, and the enemy loves it. The enemy loves it. He's the accuser of the brethren, the enemy. You're the church, so how can you miss church when you're it? You're, you're the church, so how can you miss it? You're it. And that, I, I hope I can get here, that brings me to another confusion here in, in Hebrews, that says, well, the law's written on your heart. So they think, well, you know, that's, that sounds good. You're dead to the law. You're not under the law, but it's written on your heart. Oh, really? So now that the law's written on your heart, you got this innate desire to avoid shrimp, to, to stop eating bacon? Uh, you say, oh, no, not the dietary laws, just the Ten Commandments. So now this law that I'm dead to, 
you're telling me that God has somehow wrote it back, back in my heart. Now, that doesn't make any sense. I hope you can see what I'm, I'm saying. So we've got all this double talk. We say, I'm, I'm, I'm dead to the law. I'm not under the law, but it's written on my heart. Christ, Christ is the end of the law, but it's written on your heart. How are, are we saying something is written on our hearts that Christ ended for us? I mean, what? We're, that makes no sense. Now, let me, let me get here to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 16. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds while I write them. Well, it says it right there. But I want you to notice he says laws. That's plural, L-A-W-S. In the Old Testament, quoted from Jeremiah, it's law. Singular. The author of Hebrews here changed it. I mean, can he do that? Well, guys, it's done all over the New Testament. Apostles will change an Old Testament quote. Jesus did it too to make it fit a new covenant reality. So we got laws written on their hearts. What is it? Is it the 613? Maybe it's the 10. Maybe it's the 9. I, you know, the 9 minus the 7. We're looking, at, we're, we're looking for things written on our hearts, and then we, we buy the lie, we accept the double talk, that it's the Ten Commandments. But Paul said that through the law, I died to the law so that we might live unto God. So apparently living unto God has nothing to do with Moses. In Romans 6.14 it says, Sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under the law, but you are under grace. So whatever is written on my heart... It has to be grace and not law. It's not Old Testament laws that's written on my heart. Also notice somebody comes and says, uh, you know, I don't, want, I don't want sin to keep mastering me. What do I do? Uh, I saw a person the other day scared to death because they, they smoked and they're thinking a cigarette keeps them from God. They think, you know, dipping snuff, chewing tobacco, a glass of wine keeps you from God. Guys, that's a health issue, not a covenant issue. And, and the person that's condemning them for it, five minutes later, pulls out and goes to McDonald's and gets them a Big Mac. You're dying of uh, lung cancer. He's dying of high cholesterol. It's a health issue, not a covenant issue. Okay? You don't want to be controlled by it. Paul says all things are permissible, not all things are profitable. It's a health issue. It's never going to divide you from God. I hope you can see as the scales fall off your eyes and you see you don't have to be freaked out. You don't have to be scared. And when that happens, the law is no longer doing its work in you and that's, you're dead to it. It shouldn't be. Because the law puts pressure on you. The law says you better behave. The law demands you. It induces fear. It says you better, you better live up to this. Look how scared people are today. I mean, what are they thinking? God is mad. God is not mad. He's satisfied. Jesus finished it. It's, it's over. People are scared because of the church, because of the law that's being preached. That's what the law does. That induces human effort. It comes in so we try to work really, really hard or God's really going to be ticked off if I don't do all this. The problem is it's, the train's too heavy. The law kills. That's, that's its job. So I, I ended up in worse shape than what I started out with. If we'll just relax and say, you know what, Father, I'm under grace. I'm looking to you. If I have a problem, you're big enough to tell me about it. If I have an issue, you're big enough to work with me on it. You're my counselor. You're my teacher. You're my guide in the all truth. I'm going to allow time for growth, allow time for the renewing of my mind. I'm going to say no uh, if it's controlling me, but it's going to be done in trust of you, not in fear of you. That's a huge, huge difference the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ that's when we were unbeliever so that we might be justified by faith that is salvation now that faith has come we're no longer under that schoolmaster so what is leading us what is in our daily what is leading us in our daily lives you should have zero relationship with the law for daily living it's a free fall into Jesus we're, we're led by spirit we're not under the law now, I'm just about out of times, but out of time, but I want to give you this verse, Ephesians 6:24. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus with incorruptible love. King James says insincerity. 
The love of the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength is fulfilled in the new covenant as God has deposited his incorruptible love in the person of Jesus Christ in you. So you will love no matter what because it's written on your hearts. Guys, I'm out of time. Lord bless you. I wish I could stay a little longer here, but I can't, so we'll see you next week. Lord bless you, and so long.